have an amazing panel for you this morning. The work that you're doing is not just the work being done here in Alabama, but it's part of what's going on nationally. You will, and you will hear from four, I'll give you a little talk about America Walks, what Mark didn't tell you already, four national experts and myself to tell you how your work fits into a much more global <coughs> growth pattern that's going on and to tell you what's out there to help you do the work that you want to do. So I'm, um, it's really my pleasure. What we're going to do, just so you get a sense of this, each of the, the panelists are going to give about a 10 minute talk about their work and you should write down any questions you have because at the end we're going to come back and you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions and these are much sought after consultants and professionals so take advantage of this opportunity to get a little advice and use their brains a bit. First, we have Emiko Adderton. Emiko, would you come join me? And she is the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition. You've seen and heard a bit about that today. She oversees the coalition's federal advocacy, communications, research, and technical assistance program. She uses her expertise in transportation, policy, public health, land use, economic development, and legislation to consult with communities all over the United States, and I'm sure she'll have a lot to tell you that's going on around the country. David Camp, David, come join us. David is a landscape architect with over 30 years of experience in both the private and public sectors. His leadership is unique in that he promotes health through design and has, had, has done a lot of work to um, determine how landscape and nature can, it, can be used to restore you. Uh, and so he will tell you how that's being used around the, the country, the globe, and how we might think about that for Birmingham. Charles McKinney. Charles. Charles is a senior consultant at Bitterman Redevelopment Ventures. He invented a practice as a practical visionary solving long-standing <coughs> problems, envisioning new futures and finding ways to weave motivated communities. He is the co-chair <coughs> of the City of Living Laboratories, which pairs artists and scientists to make environmental issues visceral and generate change. He was a past chief designer at the New York City Parks, so I'm sure there will have a lot of uh, good advice and information from Charles. Last but not least, we have Wade Walker. Wade. Wade is a vice president and director of engineering for Alter Planning and Design in the East Coast region. He has over 25 years of history working in the realm of complete streets, contact sensitive solutions, restoring the livability to streets, smart growth and walkability. He pioneered a multidisciplinary approach to giving people real choices when it comes to their streets and communities. So with, with that, I welcome our panelists. And we're, there, we're just going to sit here, and uh, some people are going to get up and give you their talk. As I said, remember to write down your questions, because you do want to have an opportunity at the end to come back and uh, ask them. So, uh, Emiko, I think you're starting yes. here. Ah. Can you all hear me? Oh, thank you. Well, I think this is just, I'm going to eat it like an ice cream cone. Uh, how do I oh, wait? Uh, so, well, that uh, comes up. Uh, again, my name is Emiko Atherton. I serve as the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is a program of a larger organization called Smart Growth America. And I'll talk about that. I also, um, I love that this is called, you know, really this is focused on communities because at Smart Growth America, I also serve as the Vice President of Thriving Communities because we really look at all the work that we do at Smart Growth America as building complete communities. And when I say Smart Growth America, uh, we work in spaces like transportation, but also housing, uh, economic development, uh, kind of the whole real estate development, the whole space, what we call the built environment. Uh, that's around you that creates these healthy places. Um, 
I was thinking about, because a lot of what Mark and I talk about is similar, and so I thought I'd start with more our personal story, the story of how this coalition came to be, and I luckily think we get to fit in the stealth team category, uh, but, but about 15 years ago, there were a group of organizations, and really people, uh, similar to who's here today, talking about how do we actually start to build transportation systems or communities that serve all users. And this was because we, uh, what we really believe at the coalition, and we, what we started to accept kind of in transportation, is that we built a system, a transportation system that served one mode, and that was the automobile. And as a result, you get things like no free range kids, you get no sidewalks, you don't get systems that serve everyone. And these have um, huge public health impacts, they have huge economic impacts, uh, they have safety impacts, they have equity impacts. And so how do we actually start to change the way we, we, we plan our transportation systems? And we call it like changing the DNA. How do you suddenly change from a practice that's been designed to plan for one mode uh, to start plan thinking about everyone in this room when they plan the system? And it was individuals who represented groups like, at the time, it was AARP, uh, the American Public Transit Association, the National Realtors, and they came up with this idea of uh, complete streets. And it was really not just one street, but how do we shift that approach? And today, there's still the steering committee. Um, there's about 15 active organizations. I'm happy that America Walks is one of them. Um, and we really work to how do we define the thought leadership around what these complete streets are, which is, again, not just about one street, but how do we shift that DNA that we're thinking so that every time we touch the transportation system, we're thinking about each one of you. It doesn't actually mean that every road is going to look like a road diet that uh, Mark was talking about. Some of them should, uh, but some of them also, uh, for, how many of you are from more like rural communities? From where? Rural communities. So they look really different, and, and it doesn't, it, we call them, I think Mark mentioned this idea, context sensitive. And so what works in a town of 1,000 isn't going to work in a town of 100,000, but you're giving people transportation choices. And at the end of the day, it's that no matter who I am, where I live, uh, you know, my age, my race, my ethnicity, my gender, my ability, that I could get from point A, say my home, to where I want to go. And that could be work, but it also could be my place of worship. Uh, it could be to access healthy food. It could be to go to school. It could be to just socialize, to get to healthcare, to pick up my parents, to drop my kids off to school in a safe, reliable, affordable, convenient way and a reasonable amount of travel time. And so that's really how this group came together, and it's kind of an odd cast of characters, uh, but it's worked really well for us because we've always, and, and, and the way that we focused as a group, because the coalition has evolved substantially since 2005 when we were founded, um, but we've always, you know, the group came together to really focus on federal legislation. How do we get Congress to say, we're going to do this at the federal level, and that actually took well over a decade, and there's still a ton of work to do. But what happened is the communities like yours, like Birmingham, Huntsville, I know other communities in Alabama said, wait, we're not going to wait for DC. And that's a good lesson for us. We should I live in DC. We should not wait for us. But that we're going to adopt our own complete streets policies, which say we're committed to, again, you know, building these streets that serve everyone. And today, over 1,300 communities have, I think, 1,400 complete streets policies, and that's represented in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, uh, Puerto Rico, so we see this all throughout the country, really communities committed to this. Um, and again, I'd just like to remember, it's, it's again, it's not a design prescription, but this thinking is, how do we build communities that are for everyone? Uh, we do, though, because of the data, and because of what we know, start with who we consider are the most vulnerable users. Uh, but that at the end of the day, we think everyone wins with complete streets. I, um, I'm going to go through this quickly. Because I think I only have 10 minutes, and Mark covered this very well. But there's a reason that we need this. And one, we hear a lot about these millennials, which I, I get to Because I'm not a millennial or a baby boomer. I never see myself with these. But what we know is that our population is going up. And that's going to be driven by an aging population. Uh, this is kind of where the population is today. 
Uh, in 2016, the boomers and millennials, they're about the same. Um, they're going to be about the same, and then we're going to see this huge increase as the millennials age, and that people need and want different choices. Uh, this is actually from that same survey that Mark showed from the realtors, but it gets into a little bit more detail about what people consider now when they're trying to buy a home. And it's that most people consider things like sidewalks and places to take walks. They consider uh, being within a short commute to work. These are things that we value now. Um, but we know that some households can't afford a car. Uh, so for almost all American households, transportation is your second biggest expense after housing. But for low-income families, it often becomes your predominant expense, and it can be up to 50% of your expense. And that's because as, as the communities are changing, we're seeing, and I know Birmingham is an example of this, more people wanting to move downtown to be walkable, and other people are priced out, particularly low-income families. And they're no longer by transit stops, and so they have to, uh, they have to get a car. But owning a car is really expensive. Uh, and so we see a, a, an unfair burden on low-income families. We also see different travel, changing travel patterns. I'm one of those that actually changed at about 35 and gave up my car. Um, and the savings that I thought I would realize though have changed because I walked past all those, those you know, locally owned shops on the way home from work. So, you know, the, the delta in my cost savings is lower, but my <laughs> shoe wardrobe is much bigger. <laughs> Uh, but here's why I think, you know, one of the reasons that really Complete Streets came together is we've heard a lot about the benefits, but what we did is when we built a car-centered transportation system, um, we really created what we call streets that are dangerous by design. We, we created streets that were safe for one mode, and we can even argue if they're safe for that, but we end up really shifting the burden to, uh, of safety onto other users. Um, this shows that, so I believe last year about 7,000 people were struck and killed while walking on streets in the United States. Um, there's been a 46% increase in the number of people who are struck and killed while walking. And what's interesting about that is actually overall traffic fatalities are going down. And part of that is we've, we've built, we're building safer cars. Like I grew up where like right, wearing a seatbelt was optional, we didn't have airbags. Um, I remember the first, so my family's really short, and the first time I started installing airbags, I actually had to remove them in the passenger seat in the front because none of us hit the height limit for safety, which is like a, another story. Um, but that, unfortunately, we see that older adults and people of color are disproportionately impacted in traffic fatalities. Uh, we run, we publish a report every other year called Dangerous by Design that really shows the most dangerous places to walk in the United States. Uh, you're right in there. You're in the top ten. Uh, one of the and so the top ten are all some belt. One of the things I think when people ask us and we don't look at causation, uh, but the, when you know kind of we we built most of our transportation system, our highway system after World War II, um, and a lot of this was built out, say like downtown Birmingham. Um, in the advent of really the explosion of the car, and so we built these high these what we call high speed, uh, high speed, high volume roadways that were about moving cars, not people. Um, and now, as a result, we are killing. I think we kill about fifty thousand people every decade right now, um, and it's only going up. Uh, there's also enormous public health impacts. So look, like that's Charles Brown. He's actually on the America Walks board, um, but we were. Um, you know, we also, the, the result of this, again, is these public health impacts. This is a map we put together with CDC data that shows age-adjusted obesity, which is in, right up here, and then diabetes. And then you can look at the pockets of physical inactivity and start to just draw, you don't need to be a scientist to draw the correlation of those, those maps. And so we really look at this complete streets as really kind of moving beyond the traditional approach, which prioritized free flow of cars, uh, designed for high speed and high volumes, and really encouraged driving. Because the fact of the matter, in most places, I live in DC, in most places you have to have a car to get to work. And you have to have a car to just get around. And so we're moving to this approach that prioritizes, again, movement of all people, 
We're changing behavior through design. We're designing for slower speeds and encouraging walking, biking, rolling, and pub, uh, riding public transit. And I'm just going to go quickly through these last slides to see how this is, um, and you can see kind of within this how it's uh, how it plays out. So really starting to prioritize all these other populations uh, and changing behavior through design. So this was a project I did in Orlando, Florida, where we did that road diet. This was actually a temporary project, but we saw as a result of adding these temporary bike lanes, people were biking, and that these cars had to slow down because we widened the roadway. Uh, but we typically, again, design for high speeds and high volumes. I'm not an engineer by training. I'm kind of like a self, I'm more of a planner, policy person. Um, but an engineer, you know, so when we started to build highways, um, we, we came up with this concept of forgiving design. And you'll know, when you, who will drive home on a freeway? So look at this. You'll notice freeways, they don't have a lot of curves. They're pretty wide lanes, really wide shoulders. There's no obstruction. In a way, that was to forgive my behavior if I swerve or something happens. So I'm not going to be in an accident. Well, we took those same principles and started to apply those to our local roads. And what happens is people drive like they be drive on a freeway, and it's not safe. Um, this is just kind of again, you know, complete streets where again we're designing for slower speeds. Uh, this again encourages driving. Uh, so this is a transit stop uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. This this exists right now, so it looks great until you notice there's no bench, and there's actually no way to access this. Transit, this beautiful transit station with no edge. There's no way to cross. So what would it mean to start adding those amenities? To actually encourage people to use this. Uh, and so the takeaway is that really, is that our traditional approach, which may or may not have worked for the time, doesn't work for the world um, that we want today. And for these ideas of healthy, thriving communities, and that complete streets are part of this approach, um, kind of my ask is that I, I believe there is a little over 10 complete streets policies in the state of Alabama is to look at bringing a complete streets policy um, to your community, but then to implement it. And that's really where, you know, we say really the rubber meets the road. But to start doing that, I was here about a year ago uh, when uh, you were working on a complete streets policy for Birmingham. And I think the real work is now actually pushing the city council and pushing the mayor and pushing the Department of Public Work to adopt that. Um, but throughout the state, I've worked in Coleman, Dublin, Montgomery, Birmingham, and actually I'm about to start a round two of work I've done in Huntsville. Let me, there's supposed to be some Huntsville people, so we're about to start a big project there. Um, really, again, turning, um, turning these policies into implementation. Uh, so I encourage you, I did not put unbelievably uh, my contact information, but I will be here and encourage everyone to uh, follow us and ask you about how you can bring these to your community. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me back there? Yes. I have a very soft voice, so please raise your hand. Uh, if you can't hear me. Um, my name is David Camp. I manage a landscape architecture firm called Dirtworks. I base it on a philosophy that dirt works, that nature can provide balance in our lives. And today, I really want to talk about nature for everyone. One of the things that I think we have to be thinking about is we have to be focusing on the scale of the individual, on designing for one individual to connect with nature. I believe that design has the requirement to provide opportunity and choice for each individual to engage with nature in their own way, on their own terms, and at their own pace. And I'm going to take a slightly different approach today. And what I'm going to do is share one project, a public garden that decided to retrofit its public um, spaces to be more accessible, and actually to welcome everyone, regardless of capability. And that's one of the things that I want to focus on today, was sharing one project. Now, I'm going to be talking about a lot of design considerations. This is not a checklist. It is not a comprehensive list. But these are the kinds of considerations I want you to be thinking about, particularly as we do our audits as we walk around. 
I thought Mark's talk this morning was perfect. The audits are a great thing. It's what we do all the time. It's the kind of detail that matters, connecting to one individual. And I'm literally going to walk you through some of the considerations we look at in this regard. And we started literally right at the entrance. First of all, folks, just say, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Right behind where I'm standing right now are two benches. But this part of the garden is a very calm, central, simple space. Elsewhere, the garden gets more complex. There's more challenges. You can choose to go there. You can choose not to go there. But here, we wanted to simply say, glad you came. Two seats are behind me, a very direct path, a direct destination at the far end. But if you notice, the light is dappled. We wanted to make sure that the contrast from a bright setting nearby to this setting allowed enough time for the eye to adjust to a different light level. That idea of understanding. Oh, pardon me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I probably won't be the first time or the last time to ask that. Um, that's the kind of consideration I'm sure that must be better back there now, um, that we want to be thinking about. The path is wide enough for two individuals who might be in wheelchairs to stroll side by side, or if the weather changes quickly, to turn around quickly and go back inside. The edges of the path have a small guide. It's great for an individual who might use a cane. It's great for an individual who might have a stroller, um, for somebody who might be using a wheelchair, or for somebody who might be in a walker those hard plastic wheels. The stones that we use, if you notice, the joints are staggered so that you don't feel the ruts in when you walk on that, or actually if you wheel across that. The reflecting pool has been dropped in height. We wanted to make sure that somebody who is sitting, somebody who might need assistance, somebody who might be able-bodied and standing straight, can all capture a reflection of the sky. But at the far end, a destination. Let's go there then we'll decide where we go from there. As you turn the corner, we had a great Yulian Magnolia that we had to work around, and we decided that's where you put the fountain. We wanted the, basically the canopy of the tree to capture the moisture. Just beyond there is a bright sunny spot, so we wanted an individual who, let's say, had limited mobility or less strength and stamina than others to capture two distinct, two distinct microclimates within a very short distance. You can go from a bright, sunny space to a cool, moist space within 20 feet. Two very distinct experiences within a short distance for somebody who simply doesn't have the strength to see the whole garden. The light. Never forget the light in a garden. Those simple moments of serendipity that happens throughout you know, the useful garden. If you notice the, uh, the wall of the um, the fountain has a very wide uh, edge to it. The edge is the same height as a wheelchair, so that you can actually put the armchair down. So we wheel across, actually sit closer to the water. But the thing I really want to talk about here is the water itself. We used a very wide trough of water that fell a short distance into a deep basin. That creates a deep meditative sound. And the idea here was to use that deep sound to muffle conversations. So you can have a difficult conversation, a private conversation, maybe a moment of intimacy within a very public setting by simply fine-tuning the water itself. Elsewhere, we use water for different reasons. Here, the water falls in thin ribbons in a, a, a high distance into a shallow basin. It's a bright sound. Here, you muffle the sound of traffic near, near the bottom. So think carefully at that scale how you're going to do this water, how to do several things. This is a wall um, that we incorporated a whole variety of experiences. It's a retaining wall holding back earth from one part of the garden to another. We decided to make that wall a garden unto itself. Lots of things to explore. Plants cascade over the wall, plants cascade up the wall, they, they grow in niches and nooks, and they grow across the stones themselves. We also created another type of microclimate. Here, trickling water that falls down is captured again by a smaller tree, um, creating those sort of moist, small ecosystems. So that the garden itself might be boiled down to just exploring this 30 foot wall. We want to introduce a certain amount of challenge in these spaces. Not everything is easily reached. You 
have to reach. You have to, in a sense, lose your upper body strength. You have to, in a sense, move across and, and in order to access water itself. Then we have a certain element of challenge in here. Lots of nooks and plants to fall, to, to, to reach. Um, we incorporated a variety of overlooks. The railings themselves are slightly wider. They have a slight arc to them, so if an individual has a, a, a certain degree of, of arthritis, it's easier to touch. They're wood, it's softer in the winter, cooler in the summer. And on the back side are changing homes in bread. Uh, the idea here was we recessed a small portion of the handrail and the homes change throughout the year. The idea is that as you come across a poem by autumn or Walt Whitman, or perhaps a poem that you've given to the garden itself. It adds an element of delight and perhaps another perspective about ways to see and experience a garden. And I'm going to go rather quickly. I could talk for hours here. Um, um, we had a, a, a fairly significant grade change across here. We kept all the walkways at 5%, but even 5% can be exhausting for some people. So we have a variety of very subtle places to pause. And in each one, there's an interesting tree, a view of the rose garden. You can catch your breath. No one needs to know. That level of sensitivity matters. If you want to capture a wonderful moment in a garden for an individual, don't make them self-conscious. Those paths, <clears throat> you know, in a sense, two or three paths might cross using the same uh, place to pause with different features. They converge a place to talk. And elsewhere, in a more bright, sunny area of the garden, a place to pause again. Um, perhaps to sit and chat. This is Oli and Sam, our uh, uh, visually impaired um, guest in the garden that we worked very closely with. Um, it's a spot for children with autism to step aside, to have a quiet moment out of the main part of the garden, a place simply to sort of hang out. But the planters themselves change gradually in height, sort of like creating a Goldilocks situation where you choose the height that you want, but the planters vary in a sense across, you know, across a distance so that you'll find a level that's great. The planters also allow there to be a variety of different conditions within a short distance. And this pathway that goes between the two planters, here it's tight. We want to introduce tension to the garden. Here in a sense the path is very narrow. It's only about 40 inches wide. It curves. We want you to be very conscious of going through the space. And the reward is 12 varieties of basil that cast over the sides. You are in the basil when you go through this space right here. One of the moments that, and one of the features that we never realized that, that, that subsequently after the gardens go to the back and talk to the folks, we never realized that all that basil gets brushed on your, on your sweaters. You know, you take it home at the end of the day, and then you say, I remember what I did today. Those are the kinds of moments that you can create in these spaces. The, this particular spot has a variety of spaces for group activities, but I'll end on this slide right here. It's that intimacy. We have to be thinking that level of intimacy and design of these spaces to really be inclusive. Thank you. So, David, where was that garden? Uh, Cleveland. Excuse me, Cleveland. All right. Where was it? Oh, Cleveland Botanic Garden. Cleveland. Who was in awe of that <laughs> the amount of poetry that goes into it? You know, we are also engaged in our professional lives trying to make our world better. Tell me, I've met so many interesting people, but who in the room is already engaged in the instigation, the planning, the design, perhaps the operation of public open spaces? And who in here is already working in Birmingham to improve the public spaces, the networks? So it's, um, it's really clear that a lot is already going on and that I have been asked to tell you what I consider to be the most effective tactics and principles to employ in public space making in 10 minutes. Whoa, hold on to your hat. That's what, not the advanced button, which one is it?
Um, have you ever discovered that they're working in your neighborhood doing something and no one's talked to you about it? How does that make you feel? You know, it happens all the time, and I have learned in my practice that the best thing I can do is talk to people who live there. Because you cannot pick it up in a side analysis. Because you're not there every day. There are instances where you, the things that you would never know, like that is where the fireflies breed. And imagine if you decided that was the site. It happened actually in Central Park. They put a project where the dragonflies breed, and that project was screeching to a halt. The other thing you'll do when you talk to people, you'll find out who the local leaders are. You'll find out what people are already working on. The best thing you can do, that's why I call myself a practical genius, is that I do what other people already are doing. I put that in the plan. I don't have to start it. They're motivated to do it, but you wouldn't know it unless you talk to them. The other thing is that sometimes projects seem to be impossible. This pedestrian bridge in Riverside Park was needed because it served a neighborhood that was separated from a great park by a highway and railroad. And this elected official, this man here, Denny Farrell, wanted to know what I was going to do about access to his neighborhood park. I said, well, I've got this plan for a bridge, but it costs a lot of money. You know, Denny Farrell became the chief of the, the, the uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee for New York State. And he made $25 million available for that bridge. And it didn't happen immediately, but it happened because we had a plan and we had a location. And everybody knew about it. All they knew was that we just didn't have the money. And then we had the money. That is the Denny Farrell Bridge. Now, Vincent Khaleesi was a dirt bike rider who had a terrible accident. And he lost the use of his legs. But he was still full of energy, and he was in charge of reviewing all of our design projects at New York City Parks. And the thing is, you think you know as a designer what's needed, but Vincent knew from experience what was needed. And one of the things he said to me, since I know Charles, you're doing your best. You've got ramps in that playground for those kids in wheelchairs. But that sand safety surfacing doesn't work for me because I cannot play with my children. And it happened, he said, you know, when we play, we play football, and, and there were all sorts of doors that were open to me that were easy to take care of if I knew them, and he knew them. And this is why those manuals are so valuable, too, because you can get a lot of information if you just look for that. Mark showed us a bunch of them. Inigo showed us some. It pays to get those manuals. And you'll find yourself in some situation where you just simply do not know what to do, and you say, well, what have other people done? And then if you have to meet with an elected official, you have some sort of standard to base it on. And this uh, new uh, National Recreation and Parks Association Guidelines for Disability Inclusion, Amy called that one to my attention, it talks about how you get advocates to participate, their local advocates. And then this one I was surprised to see. Why would the U.S. Department of Agriculture prepare a compendium of, of uh, accessible paths for natural areas. And I'm so grateful to have that because you can't meet the normal standards of slopes, and this tells you what the comparables and acceptables are. And this one, well, that's by me. And that's uh, for New York City Parks Department because I got just so tired of having all of our standards have to be oral tradition. And you know, what are the best practices? What do you expect? And all of these are available online, and you can get them PDF form. Oh, I'm back one too far. Who's this man? Frederick Law Homestead. Anybody know? Well, he is the father of landscape architecture and the co-designer of Central Park. If you know, he would receive no formal education in landscape architecture. He learned to appreciate the beauty of scenery by going on horseback rides with his father. And the nice thing about his work and what makes it so influential is that it has social goals, which he acquired 
by trying to improve the lot of the citizens in New York City. And the first and most important one was everybody benefits if they can escape the noise of the city, the noise and the heat, regardless of their income. And he made Central Park so that all classes could escape the city. And you know how you feel when you walk into the shade, and David went into that in some detail. But it's an amazing thing. And the other thing he said was that there's already something good there. Find out what it is. You don't have to make something new. Find out what is there. This is this, what's called a cenote. I did a project in Mexico, and the, the guys at my first meeting that you saw there, they said, there's a cenote here. And I said, well, let's go see. Well, you can't really see it because it's buried. But we said, well, that's a primary feature of this park. That's not the one, but this is the one that we showed later. Uh -huh. This slide is worth gazing at for just a moment. Uh, the importance of scenery. Where it, you see the scenery, not the trash cans and the roads and the cars, makes it a completely convincible illusion that you are not in the city. And that has to be done very purposefully. And Olmsted and Box did that in Central Park when they did this in 1875 before there were cars. They said, well, these horse carriages are going to need to get back and forth across the park, and we don't want it slicing the park up into pieces. And they put a big part of the budget into sinking those roads. And we feel so much better because we have long sidelines with no cars, and we have separation for the uh, carriage roads, which have become the jogging paths. And there's not the conflict that's created when you mix the users. Now, moving on to the current day, in New York City, we have quite a lot of systems, but we said, is every playground, is every neighborhood well served by a playground? We said, what's a reasonable distance to walk to, to a playground? Five minutes. So we put circles around the, every playground in New York City. And we said, well, that wide area up there, that's not very well served, is it? I mean, I'm sorry, the wide area is a cemetery. Ha! <laughs> so I guess that's OK. But the gray area is not, because that's a population. And so the standard was that you're going to, uh, we want you to be able to get to the playground within a five minute walk and a park or uh, a field within a 10 minute walk and then there are other standards for other facilities. And every neighborhood might have other needs and so if there's a neighborhood like David and I discovered in Riverside Park, there was a neighborhood that had an Alzheimer's Center and these people really could not use the park. And so we said, well, what is it you need? Well, we need a bounded area. We need it so that Alzheimer's patients can wander, but not wander away. And that there was uh, other things about how they do their wayfinding. And this one is a wheelchair a football field, which was located in a place where people in wheelchairs could get to, and that's an organized sports league. And of course, there's skate parks, and that uh, adolescents need places where they can not be under our thumb. And so I think Birmingham is going to get one um, under that uh, new elevated highway downtown at the Civic Center. And you know that they were the most vocal group who participated in our community workshops. They wanted to make sure we knew that they needed that. The other group, which is so uh, easy to take care of and so often overlooked, are after-school activities. There are some, uh, Inigo mentioned, I think, uh, failure by design, and that we have a lot of uh, public housing areas in New York City where the social setting and the lack of after-school activities have contributed to an environment that, oh my, it costs us a million dollars a year for some to keep people from prison, in prison from about five different blocks. And 
I went out there to say, well, what's going on? And it was really hard to figure out that there were no after school activities and after school fighting was a major problem. So this is something that could be fixed and certainly could be fixed for less than a million dollars a year. My greatest dilemma is, how do you make that argument effectively to your elected officials? We're desperate for it. The, just the wisdom that comes from uh, you know, organized effort such as this. The, the, I think that you know, out of this workshop, I think that Mark's guidance is gonna uh, motivate us all to try to improve our sidewalk environment. And I, I think that there are other things such as after school recreation that are of similar value. I won't have to cover the line, but I would walk past this uh, little clock every day on my way to work, and every day those little eyes would be looking up, waiting for those bears to dance. And it was, uh, there's, you have to, if you think about curiosity and uh, just being tickled by something, it's so nice to have those things. And when David explained that you're walking through the basil and it's rubbing on you, and you can smell it when you get home. What a joy. That kind of thinking can be applied so much throughout our city. And the pond that you can sit and watch the tadpoles had been a mud hole. And these sorts of places were, you know, it's so nice. I know that Rev is working on a system of connected parks and uh, bikeways and walkways in Five Points neighborhood. So you know that, that uh, uh, people are making those efforts, but it is so rich when those networks are also ecological networks and, and drainage networks, and you'll have more birds, and you'll have more bees, and you'll have cooler and prettier places to walk. Our Department of Transportation commissioner decided she did not need anyone's permission to paint. And she said, I am really the commissioner of mobility, not cars. And consequently, we have a very extensive and growing bicycle network that my wife makes use of to ride her four miles from our home to her office. And she's not the only one. And then the almost last thing I'll talk about is that you can't do anything without thinking about what's going to take it to maintain it. How many of you have seen you know, projects that fail because they're not maintained? This project by Nancy Owens, she said, uh, I would, landscape architect Nancy Owens said, well, I don't have a lot of money, but I'll make swales. They'll collect the water, and I'll plant grasses in them, and they'll grow up fairly quickly. And you know that it only took two years before this project was on the cover of Landscape Architecture magazine. She didn't have to wait for those trees to grow. She had the grasses, and they were so pretty that they, you know, caught that attention. The, uh, you always have, when you design, you have to balance the money that you have to maintain the park with what you think it's going to cost you to maintain it, and it never really works out well. But it really is one of the first questions to think about is, does the city have any money to take care of this? Am I going to get anything more than mowing? They did that when they built the Brooklyn Bridge Park. And they said, well, we haven't really designed the park yet. What's it going to cost us to maintain it? Oh, we're going to need, oh, we're going to need five or six billion dollars a year because uh, we have some infrastructure things in place. You can't eat enough hot dogs or drink enough charitable cocktail parties to do that. So they said, we'll set aside four lots. We're going to lease them out on an annual lease and a million dollars a lot. So for a hotel, four of the three apartment buildings, and uh, that will pay to maintain the park. Now, that is not all I know, but it's all the time I have. <laughs> and I, I have something which I just wanted to say is that it just occurs to me that there's nothing really you can't do if you have a plan and a coordinated effort. And it seems to me that one of the nice outcomes from this conference might be 
a pitch to the mayor who wants to improve every neighborhood in Birmingham and say, you know, mayor, sidewalks don't cost a lot of money. And we need them. Thanks a lot. I think we're a real example of the multidisciplinary approach here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, speaking of multidisciplinary, um, you'll see you'll see here uh, the PE behind my name. Uh, confession time: I'm an engineer by training. Love the smell of fresh laid asphalt in the morning. <laughs> uh, but you'll also see this honorary SLA. That means that I have a heart and a conscience when it comes to design. Um, and so, you know, through, the, through my career, I've been fortunate to be involved in a lot of, uh, a lot of things with mobility as a result of, or, or with a direction toward more of placemaking. Uh, and one of the things that, that we've seen is this transition of greenways from more than what we call just a walk in the woods. They're no longer just recreational facilities. They're connecting communities. They're connecting people. Uh, and we're also seeing real returns on the investment as well. So where we thought we had just recreational amenities, you know, we now have things that are contributing to the environment, they're contributing to uh, safety, real health benefits. And the two that I'm really gonna focus on uh, with these are the economics, return on investment, as well as the overall mobility and connectivity uh, that, these, that these kinds of facilities can afford. From an economic benefit, uh, if you see greenways, you'll see that you know, we, are, we now have this whole field called trail-oriented design, uh, where developers are seeing the value and they're actually selling the amenity uh, as well. So uh, seeing things like housing uh, along these greenways, uh, as well as other, uh, other amenities. Uh, and from a mobility standpoint, you know, we are seeing a lot of people that are now using these facilities uh, to actually, as, as the, the way that they get around, the way that they get to work. Um, one of the things, I, 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 I love Mark's, um, Mark's statistic this morning about the, uh, the, the kids that don't have driver's licenses. Uh, I have a colleague that said, well, yeah, that, 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 that makes perfect sense to me. Of course, kids today don't want to drive. It interferes with their texting. <laughs> but, but we're now trying to, to serve a completely different uh, demographic of people that car ownership is not their primary concern. Uh, and then we also are serving uh, transportation disadvantage that they, maybe they can't afford a car uh, to be able to get around. So we're now seeing these kinds of facilities pulled into that discussion as well. You know, we're seeing the social and health benefits, uh, the, the money that is no longer spent from being, uh, people being able to be active uh, from, from a health standpoint, as well as you know, how many people do you meet along a trail or do you want to go, uh, go, go see them? Uh, and, and take a walk with your friends or with your family. And we're seeing it right here. We're seeing it in Alabama. This is, uh, I, I, I see the, the Huntsville contingent is, is giving, me, giving me a thumbs up, but this is one that we've been involved with. It's the Singing River Trail. We connect Huntsville to Decatur and then over to Athens, potential uh, about 76 miles. Um, but these larger regional trails uh, are, are being pieces. Uh, there's real economic benefits. You know, $13 million in annual benefits related to uh, redevelopment, job creation, health benefits, um, transportation benefits as well. But the connections make sense, is the, the connections need to be made, uh, and this is where Complete Streets come in. You guys from Huntsville again, Sprague Street, right in downtown, uh, one of the first protected bike lanes uh, in, uh, in Alabama. Recently won the Smart Cities Academy uh, Award. This is actually from just a couple of, a couple of days ago, I believe. But, um, so what I want to talk about, I want to talk about three places that are actually on the ground and are now generating these kinds of things, but they're also seeing a transition in the role. Uh, one from South Carolina, one from Arkansas, one in Tennessee. So the first one is uh, actually in upstate South Carolina called Swamp Rabbit Trail. Great name, by the way. But uh, one of the leaders in this implementation was Palmetto Healthcare. So it was a healthcare organization that put money into, uh, uh, match money in. 
But what they're seeing is not only are they seeing benefits in Greenville, uh, it has actually really spurred the revitalization of the town of Traveler's Rest. Uh, up on the North Carolina, South Carolina border, which is the northern terminus of the swamp rat. Uh, people use that. People go from Greenville, the, uh, the, the 30 miles, up to, up to Travel Trust, or TR as we call it locally. Um, but you see half a million users per year um, in investing a, a lot of money. That bottom, that bottom uh, statistic is interesting because about 12% of all people using it are using it for transportation. So this is where we're seeing that change in role on Greenland in that people are actually using this to get from place to place uh, for their daily, uh, their, their daily needs. Some of the spin-off that we see, uh, things like the farmer's market in Traveler's Rest, located right on, uh, right on Swamp Rabbit Trail, cafe and grocery, you know, cyclists and, and people walking these longer distances need food, they need water. Uh, certainly see that. Uh, brewery and taproom. I, I'll tell you, I, I think there's four things that, uh, that definitely follow trail uh, development, four pioneering things. Beer, <laughs> cyclists need beer, cupcakes, uh, coffee, uh, and a bike shop. And, and you'll see that theme. Uh, any, any successful trail pretty much has those four elements uh, as well. But then this is just a shot of downtown Greenville, and you see the spinoff that has happened there. It's also seen the reemergence of the Reedy River. Uh, that runs through downtown was basically a cesspool and a dumping ground for the mills that used to be uh, in downtown Greenville. But actually, reuse of some of the old mill buildings, redevelopment, people actually living downtown, uh, being part of that as well. Uh, Northwest Arkansas Razorback Regional Greenway, uh, 36 miles, uh, runs from basically the Missouri state line down to the city of Fayetteville, encompasses about seven uh, communities and. Uh, the, the different counties, two counties uh, as well, tying things together. Uh, you'll see that it was a partnership. Uh, it was a partnership between uh, the public and the private entities, the, the seven municipalities along there. Um, and odd bedfellows, uh, interestingly enough, one of the, uh, the, the major contributors for the match money for the, uh, the, the federal Tiger Grant uh, that funded it was the Walton Family Foundation, offshoot of Walmart. Um, no, they're not doing penance for the damage they've done to the community, but uh, much, like, much like Mark was saying this morning, these companies are all about attracting and retaining talent. They're looking for people to come work in Bentonville that are very, very interested and, and really want this active lifestyle and active outdoor and maybe not necessarily have to rely on a car for every mode of transportation. So it, it does go through some beautiful country as a native Arkansan. I tell you, it's absolutely beautiful country out there, but it serves other roles as well. It's created a lot of jobs, uh, and from the Tiger Grant, uh, we had to track all of this, created uh, 52 planning and design jobs through the survey uh, and the, the construction documents, over 100 construction jobs, new construction jobs through the 36 months of construction, uh, and that last one was out of the Tiger Grant. We've blown that number out of the water. Probably over 500 jobs created, a lot of spin-off development. Uh, and then it also makes connections. So this idea of being able to get kids from their neighborhoods to school. So on a micro scale, it's connecting neighborhoods to destinations. But on a macro scale, it's creating a tourist destination as well. Uh, from a tourist standpoint, uh, the trail runs right through the campus of the um, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art up in Bentonville and has spurred a lot of revitalization in downtown Bentonville uh, as well. And even communities that don't have 35,000 employees such as Bentonville or, or 30,000 students such as Fayetteville are seeing the benefit. This is downtown Springdale. This is a before shot of downtown Springdale. Um, and you'll see this drain in the, uh, see the drain in the center of the, center of the frame. Uh, indicative of a creek that ran through downtown Springdale and was underground. Uh, Springdale used this as a catalyst, used the trail coming through as a catalyst to help create a place in their downtown. Uncapping the creek in uh, conjunction with, uh, with the trail, creating a central park on a very micro scale in their downtown, uh, and this is what it actually looks like today. Some of the spin-off associated with that, you'll see the buildings that have now been reoccupied. Um, again, a little brewery, so we got the beer covered here. Uh, we also have the bike shop and the coffee covered. 
Um, but all of this springing up along the trail, fronting on the park, uh, and the amenity. Final one that I'll touch on is in Memphis. This one is a really interesting one because Memphis had a greenway, uh, an 11 mile greenway that ran through the center of town. Uh, this is actually one that's running along the, uh, the Wolf River uh, along the north side, north side of the city. Um, and what this one does is it helps to complete some of their system. Uh, it's a 26 mile greenway, mostly privately funded. Uh, mix and match with some public funds. Uh, been done a lot of it's been done through fundraising. Uh, the interesting thing on this corridor is a lot of the neighborhoods that front this corridor uh, are transportation disadvantaged, low car ownership, uh, and they actually can use this to either get to transit or get to jobs. Um, again, some of the benefits. You know, Tennessee shows. I'm sure, sure Tennessee shows up on those slides as uh, some of the most. Uh, uh, unhealthy communities. Uh, Memphis certainly, well, if you've ever had a barbecue in Memphis, you might understand why. Um, but, you know, we're now seeing, uh, projecting $14 million in total benefits uh, per year of this Greenway. And again, it is being used more for transportation as well as recreation and tying the community together. So in those ways, that's one of the reasons we say that, uh, you know, when we start to think about greenways today, we've got to think about them as more than just a walk in the woods. They are actual contributors to the community, and, and we should be relying on them for a return on that investment as well. Thank you. Okay, I promise we're going to get to ask a couple of questions in just a minute, but I want to follow up on uh, uh, Mark's gracious uh, uh, description of America Walks and give you just a little bit more information that you might be able to use in your, um, in your communities. Uh, America Walks is a network of advocates. Our mission is to empower communities to create safe, accessible, equitable, uh, and enjoyable walking conditions for all. We've been around for 20 years, and for the first 15, it was a pretty lonely business. We were starting just the mythology here. Six groups came together to start America Walks in 1996, and they were pretty lonely pedestrian advocates, and that continued to be the case for the next 15 years, where we had about 5,000, 6,000 throughout the country that actually were working to create walkable communities, but some a little concern about pedestrian injury. I think since 2013 or so, the last five years, we have seen an amazing explosion in interest of, with walking and walkable communities. We now have a network of over 35,000 individuals in all 50 states and over 700 different organizations. And these are your small, like Walk Princeton, where I live, has one. Uh, I don't have New Jersey Bikes and Walks, Walk Sacramento, these small groups that are local groups of advocates that are pushing for the policies, the zoning, that are, and the environmental changes that will create walkable communities. Just to let you know, we, are in, we have them in all 50 states, some places a little bit more than others. Alabama, we've got uh, you know, maybe 200 people that are interested in walkable communities that engage with us. We have a number of programs that we provide that help create this network and support this network of advocates. Most notably, our training and online work that we do. Uh, we run a number of webinars. You'll find them every month for free, uh, so please sign up. And I'll just give, this is a shameless plug. We, have a, we are doing a webinar tomorrow, and where is Karen? Karen, this is our Walking Toward Justice series, episode number four, all about disability rights and we have a group of disability rights activists who are going to come and talk to us about why and how disability rights should work with walkable community advocates so that we can all work together to create the kind of community. So if you want to 
join us. Go to americawalks.org and sign up because it's going to be an exciting discussion. We also have a, a walking college where these are competitively selected individuals who get six months of intensive training on how to be a talented walking advocate and community leader in their community. We have trained, uh, at this point, we have trained about 100 uh, walking advocates who are, one of the things they do is develop a walking action plan for their community. They're actively doing that now in 100 communities around the, around the country. And I just want you to know, Alabama has not had one act, one walking college fellow, so this is a challenge, mm. someone to uh, consider applying for next year. We also do a number, we have, everything we do is with partners, and you will find that we have a very active Twitter, social media presence, always doing some interesting Twitter chats that can be a little provocative, but they, they're a way to kind of connect with other partners and know what people are thinking and answering questions, so I invite you to join in. We currently have uh, are funding, doing some place-based work, we're funding 10 communities, mid-size, about 50,000 to 200,000 population, to create pedestrian safety systems analysis and, um, and put a plan together to really address this. This is just starting, so uh, we'll be announcing our community soon, and we're looking to see uh, what we can learn from working this way. We have uh, a very active Everybody Walk Collaborative. This is a national partnership of uh, multi-sectoral groups with diverse partners, very much similar to what Emiko showed you earlier. But these are the unusual, unusual suspects who have come together to jointly promote walking and walkable communities. And they do a lot of shared communications, message development, and sort of joint sign-on letters and so forth. And we run a walking summit. We started this in 2013. It is a national meeting that brings together um, walking advocates from across the country to share success stories, to commiserate, to learn the latest research and technology that they can use in their work, and to continue to develop this collective voice for walking and a walking movement so that we can start to you know, use our muscle a little bit. I wanted to tell you about our community change grant program. This is where we provide small catalytic grants to community groups to, to promote walking and walkable communities. And these are pretty unstructured. For example, you could get this money to build that walk across a, a, a parking lot that uh, Mark showed you earlier. And I mention this because um, these are just, I mean, some examples, but in the interest of time, I'll skip the examples because this application is now open. It opened earlier this week, and we will be uh, collecting applications until the middle of October. Yeah, middle of October. So if you've got an interesting project, especially having been here, that you think a couple of thousand dollars can help you make it happen in your community, go check out the application and apply because it's, a, it's an opportunity to really step forward and make what you're doing here today work for you, your community. And I would love to see some applications from Alabama in this, in this next uh, uh, batch. I think, I, and let me just also mention the Walking College Fellowship, those applications for the 2019 program will be available beginning in January. So if you think you or someone you know could be a great community leader in this, please uh, follow us and apply because as I said, you know, Alabama doesn't have anyone yet. This is um, our, my very talented colleagues constantly are doing word clouds with all the, work, the information we get, and this is the latest one, so I'll just leave it there while we continue to uh, take some of your questions. And with that, let's, um, before, I, before I take the floor,
board here and ask some questions. Let me just see if anyone from the audience has any burning questions or desires from our audience, from our panel here. Hey, my name is Keith Rose, I'm a blue bike chair with Rev Birmingham. Uh, for all the planning and I forgot the name, I'm sorry already. Uh, bike sharing and um, uh, public uh, greenways. Uh, in Nashville, when I was there, we had a lot of experimentation with placing uh, bike share stations along the greenway uh, in Nashville when I was there. It was a 26 mile expanse called the Music City Bikeway, connected. Percy Warner Dam to Percy Warner Park on the west side of uh, Nashville. And it went straight through downtown Nashville. Uh, a lot of people thought we were crazy in putting uh, a bike station so far out of the downtown urban core. But to your point, sir, it was about economic uh, opportunity for getting people east downtown uh, to uh, connect the job. So kudos for you seeing that, because we experimented with that in Nashville. It was a huge success. But have you seen more? Yes, yeah, um, Charlotte, uh, on the Little Sugar Creek Greenway, we actually are seeing a lot of, um, see a lot of tourist use okay. on the Little Sugar Creek Greenway, and there are stations that are a little further out. Memphis has also placed, um, not on the Wolf River Greenway because it's a five-year program, and, and we've got four or five seconds of, of 13 seconds completed, um, but Memphis just started by chair, and they actually do have um, some locations at Shelby Farms Park and at Overton Park, which are connected by the Shelby Farms Green Line, six and a half miles uh, along the Shelby Farms Green Line. So, uh, and what they're seeing is a lot of use for people to come to the park, they enjoy the park, they decide they want to get on a bike, they ride the Green Line, either leave the bike at, uh, at Overton Park or, or bring it back to Shelby Farms. So, yes, we are seeing that, and you know, we are seeing those kinds of uh, locations as attractive for bike share stations. Thank you. Any other question? I have a few, but I'm giving you the first choice, first chance here. Um, several of you mentioned the, the health and economic benefits, and I just wanted to underscore how you make that case. What are you, so if each of you would take, you know, make three or four sentences that you use to make the health and economic argument for complete streets, for nature, for parks, for greenways, because I think that's an important argument here. So, and so I'll let you start. All right, so the way that we look at it is we actually published a report a few years ago called Safer Streets, Stronger Economy, where we looked at the return on investment, and we measured our return on investment as economic, but also health benefits safety benefits, the way we do economic is looking at things like big businesses. Uh, we compare parallel corridors to look at number of new jobs added, property values, sales tax. Um, but we also looked, you can use some USDOT or US Department of Transportation uh, modeling to look at averted, uh, averted collision costs. Um, so we look at kind of the averted collision costs um, that have to do with insurance, missing work. Um, so we look beyond just kind of the standard ROI to those health benefits. And then health is interesting to measure where we want to look at, um, we want to look at kind of mode shift and, and how people are shifting, but also where they're going, access to services, and then who that, who that is. I always want to underscore that when we talk about things like you know, any type of benefits, the who of, is actually receiving that benefit is equally important because if it's just people like me, that's probably not, you know, is it people of all ages, of all incomes, of all races? Are we, you know, who, the who in all of this? And the preponderance of the evidence says complete streets does improve health and increase economic yes. vitality. Okay, great, great. Um, we look at it more from a therapeutic standpoint, uh, increased mobility, increased strength and stamina, uh, social ability, uh, lesser um, use of pain medications, those sorts of things, but also increased staff retention. On a lot of facilities that do have access to nature, staff stay longer. Uh, but I think more than anything, it's using nature as a therapeutic tool, uh, particularly looking at motor cognitive skills, those sorts of things. I tell people that it'll improve their love life. <laughs> Especially if you're single. 
because when you're, uh, when you're in your car, you're not going to make contact with anybody. And when you walk past someone you're interested in, it's not really threatening. But if you walk past them a couple times, maybe they'll talk to you. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things that, that we certainly have seen is, you know, you, you'll notice the places that I put up are, you know, they all fall on, uh, on that map of uh, obesity and diabetes and, and different health issues. And just by providing people that opportunity to get out and be active, um, we're seeing these, uh, we're seeing facilities, uh, one in uh, Northwest Arkansas and then also in Charlotte on the Little, little Sugar Creek Greenway. Hospitals have actually made access points, or, or in the case of Northwest Arkansas, Mercy Hospital has a trail net. And it is for people that are either in the hospital to get out, they can, if, if they're able to get out on the trail, they can do that, or people visiting people in the hospital to be able to get out, uh, or staff, uh, doctor staff, uh, those kinds of people. Um, I think one of the other things that it does is you're, it starts to overcome a lot of the objections to uh, why people don't let their kids be free range uh, by providing eyes on a trail. Um, it's really funny that, that one of the things that, that we see that we, we often run into with, with Greenways is community opposition from people that live right along the corridor. Uh, particularly interesting with things like a rail to trail, where the railroad has been abandoned and it's going to be converted to the trail. Um, you know, you get everybody out of the public at the first public meeting saying, we don't want that trail in our backyard. Well, you used to have a train in your backyard. Um, but we, we don't want a trail in our backyard because uh, somebody's going to ride up on the trail, come in my house, take my big screen TV off the wall and ride off on their bicycle. Don't know that I've ever seen that happen. But you know, one of the things that we saw in Memphis was uh, to alleviate that, we actually put in call boxes on the Shelby Farm screen line. We put in uh, 911 call boxes. The only two times they have been used in the 10 year history of the Shelby Farm screen line were for medical emergencies. Absolutely no crime. Uh, along the Greenway, because you're getting eyes on the Greenway and people using it. Uh, the biggest complaint now that we have on the Green Line is, why didn't you build it wider than 10 feet? There are literally traffic jams on really nice afternoons in the summer. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that I think we can overcome uh, and some of the, the, the community health benefits that we see. Well, you absolutely anticipated my next question, because I think can I just do a follow up to wait on that? Have you had any success with um, sort of trail ambassador programs and things like that? Some people want to call them neighborhood watch, but I've heard the term trail ambassador use because it sounds friendlier. Um, you guys had any success with that on any of the Greenway or anybody actually? Parks, Greenways, trails, where um, you know, putting eyes on the street even better than call boxes for that sense of safety. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, Mark, one, one of the places that we see it with, and I wouldn't necessarily say that we are seeing it on more mature Greenway projects. Um, we, shall we call I'm sorry, the Wolf River Conservancy actually does have people on pieces of the Wolf River Greenway because it's not all completed and connected yet. So there are some isolated pieces, um, and, and it is an area of town that is, you know, people think about it not being the kind of place that uh, uh, maybe some unsavory activity that might take place. Um, we're, we're not, again, we're not seeing any of that, but the Conservancy does actually have people out there on occasion just to answer questions or um, see, people, see people out there and, and give them direction. Or if they have questions about, hey, what is this? Where is it going to go? They can, they can tell them that as well. Um, the, the, the hardest part, the hardest part with most of the greenways that, uh, that, that we're doing is keeping people off of them during construction. <laughs> as, as soon as you clear a path, there's people out there. It's, uh, it, it's really funny to see. Uh, I, going back to uh, talking about challenges, I definitely think that forewarned is forearmed. So can you talk about one or two of the opposition or challenges that you face when you bring in a complete street or want to do major or a park and just let people know what you've done about it. Okay, quickly, very quickly. I think the biggest one that we hear as a project is going in is the, you know, 
not on my street. It's like a you know, not in my backyard, but it's going to slow down congestion or it's going to slow down traffic. And then again and again, when we've looked at these studies, um, and I can talk to people specifically, it usually doesn't slow down traffic volume or traffic time, um, and still achieve, achieves the same goals. But the people's perception of what's happening is usually very different than the reality. I think perception is a is a good word because I'm going to pick up on that as well. Um, we often are faced with spaces might be safe, but are you perceived to be safe? And that perception is often a fear factor, the hesitancy that builds in. So it's eyes and ears, it's materials, it's those kinds of details that matter. This is a problem lots of people should have, but who has heard this one? I don't want you to improve my neighborhood because of gentrification. So, you know, if you got a crummy sidewalk and a crummy playground, it's not such a desirable neighborhood. And it's sad to think that you wouldn't want to improve your playground, but people feel threatened when you improve the neighborhood sometimes. And that uh, Majora Carter, who's this very smart black woman active in the South Bronx, has started this thing she calls self-gentrification. And what she says is she says, buy your property now. It's going to improve around here. It's a good investment for you. And you should be the person who benefits from this uh, appreciation of the value. And there's her website. Uh, you can find her. Google, uh, Google M-H-A-O-R-A Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R. -E and you'll see this. And you'll see testimonies from that people who could afford to buy their property and would do so once they had the confidence that things will get better. Just to follow on real quick, to, and, and you heard one of the things that, that we saw as a challenge. Most of those trails, when a greenway goes in, the very people that are backing up to the trail and said that they were worried about mm -hmm. crime are the first ones that are cutting new gates in their fences and putting <laughs> makeshift access points onto the trail, and when they sell their house, it's called trail front, or greenway front. And they're reaping the benefits of what you said, of the increase in the property value. Yeah, thank you. We could, I mean, we could have a whole meeting on uh, gentrification and displacement and how we mitigate that. That's your next summit. Right. Join me, and uh, yes, quickly, because we're out of time. Yeah. No, okay, go ahead. Um, I go to UAB, I'm in the graduate school program, and recently, unfortunately, got hit by a car crossing your crosswalk. So I'm very happy to be here and um, say, obviously, much always all messed up. But my question was, if y'all had any success stories where a campus lied in the heart of a big urban mm -hmm. city, and it seems like, for example, I got hit on the University of Illinois, which is one of the most congested, high traffic areas of Birmingham, for both cars and pedestrians. And it seems like there's a big conflict or divide because that's the main street to get on the interstate. Mm -hmm. And so the car is definitely prioritized over the pedestrians. So I just want to hear some success stories from other campuses. I think some of it is, is just a cultural thing. Um, Georgia Tech <laughs> has done a good job on, and of course, you know, you want to talk traffic, Talk Atlanta, Atlanta's at the top of the list as far as really heinous traffic. Uh, and of course, tech is right in the heart of Atlanta. Uh, but tech has really made an emphasis on walkability and cycling and has implemented several of these uh, street retrofits around campus. Um, is it perfect? No. But uh, it's certainly a step beyond what, what it was. I would say we know engine what to do from an engineering point of view to fix pretty much any of these streets. What we don't have is the political will to get it done. So you're, I think, building the political will and support to push on this. It's, it's at University Boulevard is a state highway. So you have to get so there's you got yeah. state DOT. And that, you and have that's to the state versus county versus city. It's com it becomes complicated. Uh, we'll, we'll have to. It's not. 
Oh, well, maybe that's the first question, is finding out who owns the highway. And getting them all the, the to walk it. Getting all of those agencies to go on a walk. Across it. Right. Right. Looks like we have moved um, lunch. Lunch. Okay. First of all, join me in thanking our panel.